Welcome to the show, Sonia. I'm so thrilled to be here, Andrew. Now, for those that are listening, uh, we actually had Sonia in last week. We had a technical glitch, first time it's ever happened. So we did the whole podcast with no audio recording. So I'm super happy to have you back. Thank you for taking the time to do that. That's and, right. Well, <clears throat> you, you first got to know first to know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and now it's the second time to know first to know. That's right. All right. Look, the, uh, before the election was called, the Green Party controlled two seats mm -hmm. in the Legislative Assembly. There were two independents, mm -hmm. uh, being Andrew Weaver and Daryl Plakis. Mm -hmm. And then there were equally 41 seats mm -hmm. held by the BC NDP and by the BC Liberals. Uh, 42 by the Liberals. Oh, oh right, for, because uh, that's right, Tracy Reddy's resigned, so 41. Right, 41. Um, but basically, the, you had a, signed a what was called the CASA. It mm -hmm. was Control and Supply Agreement that was signed between the uh, Green Party and the BC NDP. Mm -hmm that was designed to not have a coalition, but a coalition of sorts where there was a, uh, uh, effectively a, an ability to have a stable government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that John Horgan clearly stated in his press release when he was calling the election mm -hmm. was that British Columbians needed to have a stable government. Now, you spoke to him the Friday before that Monday. Walk us through that conversation and what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Confidence and Supply Agreement, CASA, um, it was signed by every member of the NDP caucus and every member of the Green caucus. So 44 signatures on there. Uh, and it did. It committed to stable government uh, to until October 2021. In that agreement, it said very clearly that John Horgan and his government would not call a snap election, uh, that they committed with their signatures to that agreement. And then we also passed legislation uh, updating the fixed election date to the October of the fourth year of after an election. So the very beginning of this election campaign was basically John Horgan breaking a commitment and agreement and also going against the law, the legislation that said we have fixed elections in BC. And the reason we have those fixed elections is so that parties don't focus on their own fortunes while they're in government. They focus on governance. And that's, that's put us where we are right now. I did meet with him on the Friday before he called the election. I had delivered a letter earlier that day, and that letter is available publicly. It's on the BC Green website. And the letter outlined both the moment we're in, so we're in a moment of a global pandemic. We're in a moment of economic and financial insecurity for a lot of people. We're in a moment of deepening mental health and anxiety issues. Um, 400,000 people surveyed in, in BC, over half or 40% indicated their mental health had deteriorated. We're in a moment of kids being back in school, COVID rates rising, teachers not feeling safe, still operating in a sense of scarcity in our public education system at a time when we're trying to jam a, a pandemic inside that already scarce feeling uh, foundation and framework of our public education system. And, and it was in the letter saying, this is a moment when we rise above partisanship. This is a moment when we put service to people first. And we identified a number of things that we thought we could be working on. At, starting yesterday, we would have been back in the legislature, including really moving fast with more ECE spaces, early childhood education, really moving on the homelessness crisis, the housing crisis. I was just in Duncan yesterday. And the success of the, the intervention that was made because of COVID, where uh, Hotel space was purchased by BC Housing, and people have gotten stable housing. And we talked to some of the folks, to Bob and Barry, uh, about what a complete turnaround it's been for them to know where they're sleeping at night. And I just want people to kind of reckon with that. Imagine every day you spend your day not knowing where you're going to sleep at night and what that would do to you on a day-over-day -day basis. And so Barry immediately was able to start contributing back. He cooks for the residents every day, makes sure that there's fresh food. He's out in the community helping other people navigate to get the resources to find housing. And that was a, a really great example of government rising to the moment 
and saying we're going to work with local communities and local governments, and if they bring forward solutions, which is what happened in Cowichan, uh, we're just going to execute, right? Make it happen. And now all of that is stopped. So we're in October. We're having this beautiful fall. But we know that rain is coming. We know it's going to get cold. And there are way too many people in BC right now who still don't know where they're going to sleep tonight. And that's going to get worse. Uh, and it, it's, you know, at just a human level. It's really devastating that all of the, the tools are down on that work right now. Mm -hmm. We heard yesterday that the grant money for small and medium-sized businesses is stuck because there's no government in place. Um, and again, that goes against what Horgan said before the election. No, nothing would interfere. If we had an election, it would be fine. Well, that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. And so there's many that. things that are on hold right there's, now. There's a lot of things on hold at a time when it should be the opposite. And that's what we said mm. in the letter. We laid out those ideas and we said just, I actually said to him, you know, be the leader that BC needs right now. Rise above. Put, put BC first. Don't put your party first. Don't put your political fortunes first. Put the province first. Mm -hmm. And he did the opposite. He put himself first. And here we are in this unnecessary election. And it does seem quite self-serving, Sonia. Yeah. Um, it, I d we haven't heard him admit why, the real reason why, but it seems hard for me to, to accept that this idea that um, there's an unstable government, largely because there has been a lot, and we're going to go get into some of this um, for the listeners to, to know what we're going to dive into. We're going to spend some time talking about Indigenous in issues, the environment, uh, but also, I want to talk about TMX and LNG and mm -hmm. Site C Dam, things that you guys were starkly against, yet you continued to, and we'll, I'll challenge you on this, but mm -hmm. we can, you know, for better or for worse, supported mm -hmm. to keep government mm -hmm. intact. And yet, uh, then there were some small issues that I saw that apparently Horgan cited as things that you weren't in agreement with the NDP on, but minor compared to these items. Yeah. And you built what I saw as a pretty good history here mm -hmm. um, with the BC NDP of supporting them mm -hmm. and working through things that maybe you didn't like, mm -hmm. but you saw it as being better staying, keeping the government intact as it was, as opposed to having a, a confidence vote, so to speak, mm -hmm. over one single issue. Mm -hmm. um, the other part that he stated was that it's never a bad time to ask British Columbians when to vote, but I wouldn't. <laughs> I would argue, yeah, maybe there is a bad time, which is during the global pandemic. This is a bad yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a time that people want to be. I, I do wonder if that that's going to haunt him later on because, um, you know, I just I just think if the shoe was on the other foot, he'd be really hard time justifying uh, the liberals doing the same thing or the Greens mm -hmm. doing the same type of thing. Yeah. But look, he has called the election. Yeah. You're in the, this campaign now. Um, what does this mean for the BC Green Party? Like, what, what does winning in this election look like for you? You're, you're obviously not going to form government. You're not at that stage yet. Maybe you could be soon, but I would say it's a fair statement to say that it's like unlikely that you're going to win enough seats to form government. But I do think it's very likely that you can heavily influence government. What is um, what is winning for the BC Green Party look like today? Is that winning mm -hmm. the three seats you have, expanding that? holding on to the two seats that you and Adam have? What does it look like? Yeah, so I'm getting asked this question a lot. And I want to huh. start with, we should be looking at elections and outcomes of elections as, as what does winning for the province look like? Okay. What's the best outcome for the province? And I, I, I want to talk very briefly about the difference between minority and majority governments. So three and a half years, we've had a minority government. There haven't been any major scandals. There's been enormous change and work done, positive change. We've, we've worked on uh, climate with Clean BC. We've worked on housing affordability. Uh, we've worked on resource land use decisions. We've worked on uh, bringing in the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, so a big step on Indigenous rights. Uh, we've worked on uh, you know a whole myriad of things. We have an Emerging Economy Task Force. We have the Basic Income Panel. We have the Innovation Commissioner. A lot has been delivered to British Columbians in the last three and a half years. Let's look at majority governments. We'll just look at the last two. Out of the um, BC Liberal era, the 16 years, um, we ended up with a out of control housing crisis where housing, especially here, was being used as a commodity on uh, a global market to deliver profits, not to deliver places to live for people. 
Uh, it became incredibly unaffordable. We saw the hollowing out of neighborhoods. Um, we had a, an opioid, an overdose crisis bloom in those years, uh, which is now an, a public health emergency for the last four years. Uh, we have a money laundering scandal, which uh, an inquiry is underway right now into looking at what was going on in BC casinos and why wasn't there the oversight that should have been happening to, to, to recognize that when people walk in with duffel bags full of cash, a whole bunch of alarm bells should be going <laughs> off, right? We had uh, cuts, <clears throat> significant cuts, especially in the early 2000s, to services. We had a basic 12-year battle between the government and teachers in this province, which ended up in the Supreme Court of Canada. And I, I think it's, it's pretty unprecedented that the Supreme Court basically comes out with a decision as quickly as they did in that one and says, restore that funding now, right? After 12 years of literally austerity in public education. So that's the majority government that we had under the BC Liberals. Let's go back to the 90s. Sure. And, uh, you know, we know that there was uh, good initiatives in the 90s. I benefited from the tuition freeze in the early 90s, absolutely. But we also had, you know, Mike Harcourt step down as leader because of Bingo Gate. We had Glenn Clark scandals. Um, we had the fast ferry fiasco, right? So we have examples of two sets of majority governments. So just the last two, we could go back through every majority sure. government in BC and find all the scandals, yeah. right? And then we had three and a half years of minority government, and we delivered policy, legislation, supports for people, big shifts in our thinking, and we didn't deliver any scandals. It's a really good point. And so when I look at this election, and I'm saying this to the people of BC, in a riding that you have a strong green M uh, candidate for MLA, Here's what you're going to get from that, from that MLA. You're going to get someone who works hard for their community, who puts their service above uh, to the community, to, the, to citizens and constituents. They put that above the service to their party. I, at no point in all my work as an MLA did I think, hmm, you know, is this good for the Green Party? That was never in my mind, right? I was working for the people of Cowichan. I was working for the people of British Columbia. I was working for the future. And, and I was driven by that deep purpose of, I'm here in service. This is an opportunity that very few people get in their lives. I'm not going to waste a minute of it. And I'm going to do everything I can to be of the best service that I can. So you're going to get that with a green MLA. You're not going to get uh, whipped votes. You're not going to get obedience. And I, I, I would say a number of the NDP MLAs who had to stand up 14 times to vote in favor of a $6 billion giveaway to the fracking and LNG industry, to LNG Canada, $6 billion taxpayer money. They had to vote in favor of that 14 times. A whole bunch of them did not want to do that. Mm -hmm. And and you will not have that. I've never had to vote for... It sort of lacked conviction, doesn't it, Sonia? It, it, I, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I've actually... Out of interest, with the BC Green Party, is there a requirement to all vote in no. certain... So, every, so you and Adam and whoever else gets elected can have independent views we and can. vote independently. And, you know, and I'll say this. If you're running for the Greens, you're running because you want to be part of an evidence-based party. You're not, it's not an ideological position we take. We look at evidence. We look at best practices. We look at the values of Greens, sustainability, health and well-being, demo participatory democracy, nonviolence, right? There are some some pillars of what it means to be green, and those are green parties all around the world. And I find it really interesting when I meet greens from New Zealand or New Brunswick or Ontario, uh, we're, we're all, all like instantly friends. We get along well because we see the world through this uh, lens, and we all have our lenses that we look at the world at, but we see it through the lens of reality and evidence and research and data, and, and we're looking at like, what can we do to get things to be better, mm -hmm. right? And taking into account these crises we're facing, recognizing that, that climate change, environmental degra degradation is very significant, that that impacts 
all these other things, but also how we organize our economy impacts our health and well-being. It impacts our, our resource decisions. There's a connectivity to how we look at the world that makes it like these instant friendships with greens everywhere. So it's, I wouldn't, you know, I, other parties will be like, well, you'll have no discipline and you'll have these, you know, crazy notions come forward or, or people voting on things that are really terrible. And no, right? And the, and the other thing, and we had this, we, we talk things through. We're looking for consensus, but it's not obedience. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that is what John Horgan wants. Interesting. He wants obedience. Yeah. And he couldn't get obedience out of the two green MLAs on bills that, that experts, stakeholders uh, were pointing out had real serious flaws in them, especially the bill on being able to detain youth under the Mental Health Act if they present with a, an overdose. And of course, we want to do everything we can to protect young people who are suffering from addiction. But when the chief coroner says, I, she was worried that this could actually result in more fatalities. When the representative for children and youth says that she was worried that this could result in more harm, more fatalities. When Union of BC Indian Chief says, hey, this is a bill that deeply impacts Indigenous people and nobody worked with us on this after passing UNDRIP, which says we're gonna always work with First Nations on, on legislation that impacts them. When health professionals are coming forward and saying, we're deeply concerned that this could cause more harm and more fatalities. We took that back to the minister and to her staff and said, work on this, come back in the fall, show us that you've worked with the experts, show us that you've worked with the First Nations Indigenous people, and, and let's find a path forward for this. Um, but what they wanted was obedience. And that's not my job. My job is to represent uh, the interests of British Columbians, and to ensure that any legislation that passes is the best legislation that could be. That's good governance. That's why minorities are so good. Well, to echo your comment, um, one of the most uh, um, powerful pieces of legislation that passed federally, as you know, if you go back to your, and I know you're a history buff, is the um, Freedom of Rights yeah. and... Charter uh, of Char Rights. Charter, excuse me, the Charter, Charter, of, Rights of, Rights, yeah. Charter of Rights and Freedom which was passed under Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but not when he had a majority government, no. but when he had a minority government yeah. later on. This is it's a very good, is, very, it, very good point. I love that you bring uh, this up because some of the most groundbreaking and progressive shifts that we've seen, Medicare, yeah. <laughs> minority government, right? It, because there's a capacity in a minority government. When, you're, when there's more than one party involved, you can actually go further, you can push harder, you can make those those leaps that are harder to make uh, under a majority because you're going to have the other side of the house coming at you. And, and I, I keep talking about this. Imagine this, Andrew. The way that we responded to COVID-19 was that all three parties just took, took off their gloves, put the boxing gloves down, and said, holy cow, we're in a global pandemic. Uh, this province really needs us. Let's work together. Let's work together. We had an emergency session on March 23rd. We passed a bill in one day to authorize $5 billion in spending, in one day. Unanimously passed all three parties, right? There were only 12 of us in the house because of COVID. Yeah. Um, and I, I... It's quite impressive. I have to say as an outsider um, observing how the government as a whole, regarding, regardless of parties, uh, operated through uh, the thick of the, the, the COVID. I mean, we're not out of COVID yet, mm -mm. Um, but how, how you guys operated in the spring and the summer mm -hmm. is impressive. And it does go back to what it seems to be a bit of a power grab here because mm -hmm. it, it appeared to me as an outsider that both yourself, your party, and the BC Liberals really held back on holding the NDP to the fire or making... Um, small jabs at them, which is typical of what you see in politics mm -hmm. during that period. And yet they've now turned the table on you very quickly and ha having what seems odd to me to have such a short election cycle, like wh why is this happening? It's, it, it, I will ec echo your comment of um, that, that it does seem odd. A lot of outside people who I know who aren't really involved in politics are just confused as to why we're having an election right now. 
Um, but going back to the fact that we are having an election. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is the, B, the BC Green Party um, consistently seems to get quite a few votes in the province. I think in the last election, 17. 17%. Yeah. Now, um, unfortunately for yourselves, we have a first past the post system, not a proportional representation system. Mm -hmm. If we had a proportional representation system with how many seats are in the... Four, we would have 14 the, seats. 14 out of... 87. 87. You've only had three so yeah. far. Um, so it, it's, it is unfortunate. And I, I, we had a referendum on this too, I believe, but it just didn't get, didn't get all the way past. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's un unfortunate because I think that your party, that, I mean, clearly by just the absolute number of votes in the province, you have far more of a following than what is represented in the mm -hmm. Legislative Assembly. But knowing that, knowing we're in an election, um, where are the key target ridings for you? Like where, where are your strong points? Where do you think you can be successful? Do you think you can win back both yours and Adam's seats? Can you get more seats? Yeah. Are there any particular communities that you want to appeal to right now to say, hey, yeah. if you're living in this riding, yeah. please help us out? So, you know, of course, we've got candidates, and it's almost a miracle, I would say. In, we had zero candidates nominated on February, on February, September 14th. Mm -hmm. um, February 14th would have been Valentine's Day. There yeah. was not a, love, a lo <laughs> lot of love on September 14th. So uh, I'd been leader for one week, as you said. Uh, one we'd week. just come through a nine month leadership race. Uh, the, the writs are dropped on September 14th, and we had 11 days to go from zero uh, to putting a full slate of candidates. We got to 74, which is incredible. Have you really? Wow. Uh, so we have 74 yeah. names on the ballot across BC, every region in BC. Um, we have uh, more women than we did in the last election. So we're not 50-50 yet, but in a snap election, diversity, gender representation just are really hammered. But we have extraordinary candidates. I was here, I think I just announced the Vancouver slate, uh, you know, uh, several PhD scientists, engineers, teachers, uh, immigration lawyer, young, young people, diverse people, uh, and, and extraordinarily already contributing to their communities. Um, we just announced uh, last week our, our candidate in Vancouver Sea to Sky, which is a riding that we're very focused on. We did very well in that riding. Yes. Um, Jeremy Valeriot, he's been elected to council in, in Sunshine Coast and Gibsons. He's lived in Whistler <coughs> with his family, with his young family <coughs> for a couple of years now. He's an engineer, very focused on waste management, uh, on how to reduce our waste and also how to manage our waste. Um, really committed to his community. So we're, that's a that's a riding if you're yeah. Vancouver Sea to Sky listener. Yeah, that's Jordan, Jordan Sturdy won that's that right. one. Now what's interesting about that riding is that if you take the BC um, NDP and Green Party votes, they were almost split e equally and Jordan Sturdy kind of came up through the mm -hmm. middle and mm -hmm. won that one. There's a, clearly a, a much more bigger favoritism towards a kind of more of a progressive party, mm -hmm. but it was split. Yeah. How do you think that's going to play out? So Listen, Vancouver Sea to Sky, I'm talking to you right now. Not only will you deliver an extraordinary MLA in Jeremy Valeriot, you will deliver better democracy to all of BC by electing a Green. Uh, we need more people in there to hold government to account, to ensure that there are MLAs who absolutely put people ahead of politics. Uh, and not just saying, showing, doing, what we've done for the last three and a half years. Sure. Southern Vancouver Island, big shout out. Southern, everybody on Vancouver Island, you have the opportunity to deliver democracy, uh, healthy, stable democracy to all of BC to ensure that there are MLAs in that building who are opposed to subsidies, to LNG and fracking, who are going to stand up for a livable future for our children and grandchildren who recognize that it's long past time to get fish farms out of the ocean uh, and using the technology that is being embraced around the world. Yes, you can do aquaculture, you can do it safely, you can do it healthily, but not in the ocean, mm -hmm. not where it damages our, our, our wild salmon. Uh, we have Alexandra Morton running for us in northern, on Northern Vancouver Island. This is a woman who has dedicated her life to protecting salmon. 
And salmon are the lifeblood of BC's coastal communities, but right up to Smithers. Salmon are the lifeblood of, of the economy. Uh, they are the, the foundational food source, source for, for coastal First Nations. And I've, I've been up in Alert Bay, Namgi's First Nation, and heard the elders talk about how they and the salmon are the same that they are salmon people and they are losing the salmon because of those fish farms. So if we want and we need so much the voices that are saying, we have to work on a future that is better than, than where we're at right now. We cannot continue to subsidize oil and gas. We can't. We should be investing in clean energy. Imagine if we were putting money and investments into projects in every region of BC. We'd be creating sustainable jobs. We'd be creating innovation. We'd be driving the next generation of technology. Uh, we should have the, the Northwest BC Institute of Clean Energy right in Terrace, right on top of those geothermal reserves. And we're not looking to other jurisdictions to tell us how to do it. We're actually inventing those those, that technology and that innovation, how to store that energy, how to ensure that it's stable right here in BC. Let's switch gears and talk about um, the TMX pipeline and the LNG project. Project. I had David Eby here a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He was my first guest on our election series. And I asked him about TMX and the twinning of the pipeline. He's starkly against it. But the, he, at the same time, he's also um, hugely in favor of the LNG Canada project. Um, and he basically, in his words, I believe, were um, not all pipelines are the same. And his theme was that you've got a refined product versus uh, um, what's the, what comes to the team? Raw, raw, raw bitumen. bitumen. Um, so can you comment on this? And then further to that question, what I am gonna ask you about is um, the BC Green Party did allow these, well, not the, not not the no, not I'll, not I'll the not, not the LNG. So let's let's make sure okay. let's, listeners let's got the, the right record history. How this all played yes, out. Okay, yes. let's okay. start with Site C because that was number one. Yeah, start with 2017, Site C. 2017, we put into the confidence and supply agreement that there would be a review of Site C by the BC Utilities Commission. Okay. That review came back in November, very clearly stated that the the amount of energy produced by Site C could be produced by renewable projects, wind, solar, geothermal. And that those projects could be distributed. So we're talking long-term sustainable jobs in different regions of the province for the same or less than what it would cost to build Site C. And what you wouldn't get with those, uh, those other projects, clean energy projects, is you wouldn't get the devastation to some of the best food-growing land in BC that we're going to get with Site C, which will flood some of the best agricultural land we have in this province. At a so time when... Listeners understand where Site C is. Can you give us so a... So it's northeast BC. It's just bet it's between Hudson's Hope and Fort St. John. Okay. I, I did a road trip with my family. That's in summer of 2016. We camped in Hudson's Hope. I met the mayor, Gwen. She was amazing. She's not the mayor now, but I, I just adore her. Um, we met Ken and Arlene Boone. We stood on their farm right in the spot that the highway was going to go through their farm. Um, we, we saw the stake that we'd bought and paid for as a donation. Um, and we went and stood over the site with Ken and Arlene and looked at this absolutely beautiful river. Uh, and then we, they, we carried on on our trip. So that was one of the big reasons why I, I really put myself into running, was recognizing that it was connected to what happened in Seanigan, right? That, um, we had decisions being made by the provincial government that were not squaring with what people in the community wanted. So BCUC comes back with this report, says very clearly, you can get the same energy. If it's about clean energy, there you go. You can get the same energy from these other projects, less damage, less impact, less cost overall because these dams are very expensive. The NDP waited until after the legislative session was over and then they went into their cabinet meetings, and as a cabinet, they decided that they would proceed with Site C. There was no vote, there was no uh, input from the other parties, 
They came out and made an announcement in December after we'd finished our legislative session and said, you know, we, we have to continue with Site C. They did not have to continue. And the, the, the argument they made was, well, we can't put this debt on the books because it would undermine our ability to do these other capital projects. They had just put over $3 billion of debt on the books by canceling the tolls uh, in Surrey, right? Again, that's the kind of politics, that's terrible, terrible governance, right? You. So as the Green, BC Green Party, you had really no say? We had no in, say. In Site C? We okay. had no say. So they, they chose, that we knew, they knew where we stood, we were very clear. We we sent a letter to the to the premier and to the cabinet saying, and a Here's project all this big reasons. can be passed without uh, your. They without there was support. no need for a vote in the legislature. There was oh. no vote. It was entirely the NDP cabinet decision to do this, okay. and we had no say. Okay. The the only say we had was to get the review. The review provided the evidence to say we didn't need to go forward with this. They ignored the evidence. Why did they ignore the evidence? Well, because they had an, another project in mind. Which is what? Which is LNG Canada. Okay. So Site C is very much connected to LNG Canada. The purpose of Site C is to deliver subsidized electricity that will be delivered to LNG Canada for less than what it costs to produce. Really? In addition to the many billions, the six billions in tax credits and incentives and all kinds of uh, breaks, taxpayer-funded breaks, delivered to LNG Canada so that they can massively increase fracking in Northeast BC, which is dangerous to groundwater, which releases enormous amounts of methane into the air, which is a faster driver of climate change than, green, than, than carbon-based greenhouse gases. So we've got methane going into the air, we've got a concoction of chemicals and a massive amount of fresh water being used to drill that fracked gas out of the ground. And the pipeline that David Eby's talking about is a pipeline that goes from Fort St. John to Kitimat of fracked gas. And then it gets to Kitimat and it gets compressed into liquid, liquid gas. But that is fracked liquid gas. And so I, I would say to David Eby, and he's a very, very intelligent person, I admire him and the work he's done in the legislature. But I would say to him, David, I need you to look at your two kids and tell them that, that you actually can stand by this decision that you made. That will, when, those, when your kids are in their 40s, this project will just be reaching its maximum uh, emissions. And it will be the largest point source emission project in Canada at a time when we're supposed to be reaching right? net zero, right? So yeah. you, had, you had Oregon come out last week and say, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna meet, reach, meet, reach net zero. Well, let's be honest about that, right? What would that entail? If, we, if LNG Canada is pumping out its emissions at the rate that it's meant to be pumping out its emissions, basically every other industry is just gonna have to curl up into the fetal position and not move. <laughs> and we're still not gonna meet net zero in 2050. So he is saying to the rest of BC, to every other sector in BC, education, high tech, uh, manufacturing, health, every other sector in BC, you guys got to sacrifice. You guys got to get your emissions down below zero somehow because we have one project that we have subsidized so heavily because it can't exist without government subsidy. It can't make it on the, on the market because it's not a viable market product right now. The, the cost of, of selling at the price that they'll sell sure. LNG at doesn't cover the cost of the project. So here's all this government money going your way. And meanwhile, for the rest of BC, everybody, every person in every sector, every industry, every individual, everybody else is going to have to sacrifice Cut, and sacrifice get your... Sacrifice more. Mm -hmm. Tell me how this makes sense. Mm -hmm. I can't... I, I'm just I, as I, confused I, as you are. Here's the thing, Sonia. Um, I think it, what the part that's most confusing is you've got three parties in BC. Yeah. You have the BC Liberals over here on my right, over here on your on your right. Sure. Okay? It's really clear yep. their position. Absolutely. They're pro pipelines, yeah. regardless of LNG, TMX, whatever it is. Like they are all in on getting this done. Yeah. And over here are you guys. Yeah. Uh, Evidence based, science based, and against 
these, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, for a future, fuel. for a livable future. Yeah. That's what we're for. Yeah. The part I find confusing is the middle group here, which is the NDP, who, when they weren't in power, they were starkly yeah. against LNG Canada. They were ripping into Christy Clark and her party for yeah. promoting this, saying it was a waste of our tax dollars to try and yeah. court these multinational corporations from abroad to come to BC. And now they're in power, and now they're in favor of it. And yeah. I just find it com- dar- like look, I find it look, confusing. Like, pick a side, folks. Let's look at all. Let's look at their environmental record. I mean, aside from what we pushed on reforms to professional reliance because of what happened for me and Seanigan and, and the, the conflict of interest that existed under having industry hire its own professionals and they report to government instead of government oversight. That's a very long story made short. Yeah. Um, uh, reform to environmental assessment. Clean BC, which is an economic plan for, for uh, addressing uh, how we're going to reduce our emissions and have a clean, healthy economy. Uh, those are the things we brought forward in addition to all the the you know the innovative emerging economy task force the innovation commissioner how do we build this new economy that we want to be part of how do we get in front of the global trends the NDP carried on with subsidizing actually increased subsidies to the oil and gas industry carried on with logging old growth forests and and had this fascinating if somewhat orwellian logic that the more old growth that cut, cut down then they would say there's the more the higher the percentage of protected old growth there is so understand this logic right I mean, so if we that have math makes sense, we have but let's just do it in, in really simple terms we have percentage terms a, a thousand square kilometers of protected old growth i'm just yeah, sure. pulling yeah, these numbers yeah. up just make it simple and we have a, a you know 5,000 square kilometers of unprotected old growth. Sure. Every time we reduce that 5,000 by 1,000, then suddenly the percentage of what is protected <laughs> gets higher, right? But yeah. what that means is we're only going to be left with, sneaky math. with this tiny I mean, little bit. Percentage-wise it does, but it doesn't actually, it's, the aggregate, like the com- entire amount of yeah. protected old growth so doesn't increase. We've, we've actually increased the rate that old growth is being logged. Uh-huh. in BC under the NDP. Have we? They have not brought forward any reforms to the Forestry Act or to the uh, Forest Range and Practices Act. Uh, that was part of our agreement. We pushed and pushed and pushed for them to bring those those p- legislation forward and bring amendments. Didn't do it. Um, and on, on um, issues like uh, water protection, they inherited from the BC Liberals what I would say was a very good piece of legislation, the Water Sustainability Act. But they didn't lean into it. They didn't say, okay, let's really look at how do we ensure that 50 years from now, every community does have fresh, clean, safe drinking water. Mm-hmm. And, and this is one of those things that if you leave that too long, you're in big trouble, mm-hmm. right? And so on the environment, uh, I, I would say that the NDP has campaigned on saying one thing and doing basically the opposite. And, and that's a, you know, this comes, this whole election keeps coming back to, can we trust what these people say? Can we trust what John Horgan says? Because he says one thing, turns out another thing is true, right? And I think that fundamentally in a democracy, being able to trust what people say, having this, the bare minimum expectation that when somebody is either seeking elected office or in elected office, that they're going to tell you the truth uh, we, we should have that expectation and we should be very mindful of what it means when people are willing to be misleading and not truthful. Uh, what are the implications for the kind of governance we are going to see from those people? Well said, Sonia. One of the things that, um, I'm impressed by is, is clearly you, when it comes to the environment, and I guess you should know what you're talking about since you're the head of the Green Party, but you clearly know what you're talking about here. I mean, it's not the Green Party of like 30 years ago, which was like aligned with more Greenpeace extreme. Like no. what, I, what I'm really impressed by the, by the Green Parties of various levels, you know, federally, provincially, even locally, uh, had Adrian Carr in here mm-hmm. recently, and um, is your ability to look beyond just the environment. Um, but one of the things that I add, I, to be a devil's advocate here, 
is you've pointed at, you've just spent some time pointing out some big flaws with the environmental mm -hmm. track record of this mm -hmm. NDP government. Mm -hmm. Yet you held them up through the last three and a half years. And there were certain events mm -hmm. that uh, occurred, like Site C. You know, you know, you've educated me that you didn't have a vote on that. But there were there have been a, a lot of situations that come up where outsiders like myself go, well, where's the conviction behind yeah. the, the Green Party? Like, you, you say these things, but then you're also the same party that's held up this BC NDP. Um, can you comment on yeah, that? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I'm glad you asked it. Okay. Let, let's look at the LNG, which I've been talking about a lot. Sure. This, this This massive bursary, this giveaway, this subsidy to uh, LNG Canada. Yeah. So that was Bill 10. Okay. It was a tax, an amendment to the Tax Act. So it was amending so that there'd be all these tax breaks and tax credits. And on that bill, there were 84 MLAs who voted in favor of it and three who voted against it. And we called it to a standing vote. We, we put forward amendments. We asked for it to be sent to committee so that it could actually be discussed with experts at the table. We asked for it to be pushed six months down the line so that people could be really informed on what they were voting on. Uh, we, we voted against this bill 14 times. It was a... It was a uh, a finance measure, right? Uh, we made it very clear to the NDP that we would vote against it, but they didn't need our support on that bill because they had the support of the 42 liberal MLAs right. who voted for it every, every single time. Now, had the liberals voted against that bill, that was a, that was a budget measure, that was a tax bill, mm -hmm. um, there could have been very much a case to be made that mm -hmm. this government isn't standing anymore. Mm -hmm. And we could have gone to an election. Now we had 84 MLAs in favor of that subsidy and three who were opposed to it. Um, and we would have gone to an election. I don't think we would have ended up with a different outcome than what we had. So the right. problem that we have in BC right now is that the two other parties are so entrenched in looking backwards, so committed to keeping us dragged back to the 20th century uh, that they can't recognize the responsibility that they have to the future. And so we absolutely did vote against that bill. And it could have been a, a, a point at which the government wouldn't have survived if the Liberals had chosen to vote with us. But the Liberals were more interested in supporting the LNG project that they had initiated uh, than they were in holding the uh, NDP to account. Okay. So Good response. we absolutely voted against it. Were there, and looking back now, were there any other opportunities that you could have um, uh, sparked a non-confidence vote? Yeah. It, when, you, when you look back now, it, realizing the sit situation you're in today. No, you know, I still go to, look where we were in 2017. Uh -huh. and, and, and in some ways similar to where we are now, but we're in a more serious place now. But we had the housing and affordability crisis that had really spiraled out of control. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of work in the first two years, and we contributed to this. We, we, we but put, do you feel like that's fixed? No, it, it's not fixed, but there's been steps. So the okay. speculation tax, the foreign uh, buyers tax, right. um, movement on building affordable housing. We've got projects underway in, in Cowichan. There are projects underway in communities all around BC. We made some strides uh, with COVID at, at recognizing how do we get emergency housing. Buying up hotels that aren't going to make it through this financial downturn has been one solution. Mm -hmm. Looking at um, modular housing that can be really put together very quickly, very efficiently. We should be looking at that right now for this winter, right? Small units of modular housing with uh, supports, with uh, that kind of presence of, of you know, in couch and what we have, a, a public health nurse on site, um, security on site, but just that, that capacity to deliver to people a safe place to sleep at night. We should be working on that. So I'm going to come back to you. you. We had the housing and affordability crisis that we inherited in 2017. It quickly became clear that we had a money laundering crisis in BC. So there was some very serious corruption and problems to, to, to get to the bottom of. That inquiry is underway. Um, we had a, you know, a lack of action on climate. Uh, 
and I can see, you know, <laughs> in some ways we've moved forward with Clean BC, in some ways we've moved backwards with the subsidies. Um, we had a, we were at the end of the 12 year battle between the, the BC teachers and, and the government and the need to really get those teachers hired back. We have a, we had a teacher shortage. We're just getting to the other side of that where we're actually ensuring that classrooms are, are being led by teachers and not by people that don't have teaching qualifications right now. So you look at all of the, I mean, that's just the touching with the opioid crisis underway, the mental health crisis sure. underway. And so at any given moment, and we got this a lot, you know, my issue matters the most. You should bring government down on this issue. And what we chose to do was, one, stay committed to our confidence and supply agreement, recognizing this, this wasn't like we had all the power and we were going to get our way on everything, um, but recognizing that we had an opportunity to really move forward with some very important initiatives. Professional reliance, again, is one that really mattered to me. Um, the salmon work that Adam did, uh, the work on Indigenous child welfare that I've been doing, um, and, and, and looking at, at the big picture, which is, again, reflective more of what you're talking about with Greens generally, right? We, we are always trying to recognize, you know, how can we affect change as a very small uh, segment of the political landscape, but have an oversized effect? And that is by recognizing that you go a lot further with working together, with cooperation, with building alliances, with bringing people in, with, with, with helping people recognize that being part of positive and productive change is better than just yelling at each other across the floor, demonstrating a, a change in culture. And then look at the inside of the legislature in the midst of all this. We had our clerk and our sergeant at arms taken out of the legislature, right? We had that whole scandal unfold. We've now got uh, the first clerk that's ever been hired by a, an all-party parliamentary committee. We have major, major policy changes inside the legislature, which actually help to protect our democracy generally. And so it's always this question of how, how do we most effectively uh, use our, our space in this landscape to move things forward? And if, it's, if, we, if we say, well, this is the one sword that we're going to die on every time, look at all the things that would not have happened in the last three and a half years. Okay, great point. There's two things I want to finish off with yeah. here. One is um, we're hearing a lot of um, you know, big announcements by both the BC Liberals and the BC NDP, or are they trying to at least make them big, um, appear big, uh, on ways to get vote. They're both vote buying kind of gigs, in my view. The one that I thought was so funny last night was when John Horgan announced that if um, um, that when a vaccine comes out, it'll be made available for free to all British Columbians. Like, of, <laughs> I, course. of course, like what <laughs> government in the world right now would say, no, we're not actually going to make this vaccine for a global pandemic available to our citizens. Of course, it, it, that's an it's, that's a health. That's a public health decision. It's also a, an economic decision. Of course it's going to be free. Yeah. <laughs> of course it's going to be widely available. When I read that, I, I thought, I, well, what else is going to be free? Uh, like free, f free... Free air. Yeah, free air, free, free water. Air for, Jasmine, you, you get, get free You get to walk air. down the street for free. Yeah, yeah we, this you is the what right we did last night. The right to a fair trial. You get, <laughs> you get free time with your family. With your family, exactly. Right? Uh, you can you don't have to pay go to, to the beach. Yeah. Free beach visits. Like, I wonder if there's a little asterisk beside that, which is that while the uh, vaccine is free, the testing will be, uh, char you'll charge $5,000 for testing. Yeah, look at <laughs> If the testing's free, why? Anyways, I so let's not, that's a, that's a hmm. goofy statement. But there's ones like, you know, the BC Liberals are talking about uh, eliminating the PST, for example. Are there any kind of big grandstand promises that you guys are wanting to come out with, that you're wanting to promote? Or is it more what I've heard so far in this last uh, hour, which is, um, you know, kind of you get what you have seen for the last two and a half years. Or is there anything in particular yeah. that you guys are big on? I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question because I was, I was really thinking, I did a little, I, I tried to do some meditation beginning and end of the day. And this morning it was about intention and setting an intention for the day. And, and we're supposed to, I was supposed to pay attention to what, what came into my mind. And, and it was clarity. And I thought, okay, of course, in this role, <laughs> clarity really matters. It's, it's important to be able to communicate with clarity. 
uh, probably with fewer words than I typically do, but I'm <laughs> that's the way I am. <laughs> uh, and I thought, uh, it, when you look at, so of course, w- we're, we're going to be releasing a, a full platform probably early next week. And, and just as we were caught you know, with zero candidates on September 14th, we had been doing platform work, but we had just finished a leadership race where the different leaders presented a vision. Right. And so our platform committee had to then say, okay, Sonia's vision, uh, we have to incorporate that into our platform. And my vision, and, and it's aligned with the Green Party, um, really starts with that notion of health and well-being. So how do we have an economy that creates health and well-being? How do we have an environment that creates health and well-being? How do we have an education system that creates health and well-being? And if we, if we say, and, and New Zealand is an example of this, they passed a health and well-being budget, right? This isn't just like a theory or an idea. This is in practice. Amsterdam is bringing a... Uh, they're moving forward with their economic recovery based on donut economics. How do we have an economy in which uh, people aren't falling into the, the middle of the donut where they don't have enough to be well, and also that we're not operating outside of the the parameters of what we can vis-a-vis the earth and sustainability. So a per, an economy is one that really operates within these these very clear parameters of people are well and the, the environment is well, right, and sustainable. And so um, our announcements so far uh, really show that central tenant of health and well-being. So um, I've talked about renter support. So if somebody is paying more than 30% of their income in rent, which economists, uh, experts, uh, very clearly indicate that if you're paying more than 30% in rent, your cost of living is too high because you 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 need that 70% for all your other needs, right? Very to have true. healthy food, to have access to, um, you know, services and, and everything you need to do well. So our proposal is, is instead of like uh, a $400 giveaway to everybody once a year, which is a dollar a day, let's just be honest, whether you need it or not, mm-hmm. it is to say, if you're paying more than 30% of your income in rent, this program is going to get you to that sustainable cost of living place, right? So it might be a couple hundred dollars a month for one person, it might be uh, more than that or less than that for another person. But recognizing the evidence, the research, the data tells us that this is a sustainable place for a person to be, so our renters. Uh, Yesterday, we talked about an investment in mental health care, bringing mental health care to be part of our health care system because we know we're, Ten years ago, we were spending $6.6 billion a year on, on the fact that we were not treating mental health in a preventative way. So what that means is people get into a mental health crisis, and because they haven't had the support and the care they need through their health system, they end up in the hospital. And that is the most expensive place in our health care system to end up. So six, you know, imagine if... And you hospitals had, aren't designed to treat... No that either no and and i'm hearing from emergency room docs right now that this is the most prevalent thing they're seeing in the emergency room is is people in mental health crisis and so if we have preventative mental health care if people have access to six visits with a psychologist through their gp right uh that can actually be what prevents that extra burden and extra cost on our on our health care system right today i'm going to be talking about early childhood education, um, and yes, we need childcare spaces, but what we build right now matters. And for me, the vision is about uh, BC being a place where every child can, go, can have early childhood education as part of their public education system. So three-year-olds and four-year-olds get 25 hours a week of early childhood education. Anywhere in BC. Wasn't one of the platforms by the BC uh, BC NDP uh, something about ten dollar a day daycare? Yeah, and and yeah. and and that's about it. Yeah, and I I recognize that the the ten dollar a day c- folks that this is a, a movement have really raised the issue of how important childcare is. Yeah, and and I agree, <laughs> it is. Again, economists say that the most important thing we can do right now is invest in early childhood education. I. I want to make it, you know, this is the clarity piece. Let's talk about where we want to get to. 
And for me, where I want to get to in BC is that every three-year-old, every four-year-old has a space in their public school system that is early childhood education because we know, we know what the research tells us, that those years of, of ECE are so vital to the, the lifelong success of children as learners and becoming lifelong learners. So that's my vision. It's, it's beyond like spaces. I, I'm not interested in sort of like a barn, of this image of like, you know, and I know that that's not what that the programs are about. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to be really clear in articulating where we want to go, right? Mm -hmm. What does this look like? What, how do we measure if we're actually getting there, right? Look at this. We have now, you know, imagine in a couple of years we say 60% of every child in BC is now accessing high quality early childhood education. We've made it a long ways. We have a little ways to go. That's a great investment. It is a fantastic investment. Mm -hmm. um, so as we bring out our planks and our platform pieces, unlike the other parties, we're not saying we're going into one riding and saying, we're picking you as a winner riding. You're going to, you know, it's like, Oprah, you get this, you get that, <laughs> yeah. you get that. You get a car and you I, get a car. I, I've really been coming out against this and saying, it's for the leaders and for the political parties to articulate a vision for the future of the province governance governance once people are elected once we have a government in place their job is to make sure that every community has the services the government services and the government infrastructure that they should expect out of government and we saw in Cowichan for example during that liberal era because Cowichan was a NDP riding right, right. yeah that we didn't get investments our high school was one of the oldest high schools in British Columbia. Our hospital was one of the oldest hospitals in British Columbia. We had the highest child poverty rate in British Columbia. We had kids It's, it's terrible. It, it makes, uh, as an outsider, it makes you kind of frustrated to think that a community doesn't get support because they didn't support the government that's in power. I want people like, to, to really <laughs> feel the injustice of that. That like I can completely no see that. community but should be punished because they voted forty yeah. percent of the community voted for one party, and another party thinks that they they, they get to be punished for that. We have to say yeah. that's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. Government's job is to look at the whole province and say how do we make sure that everybody's getting the services that they should expect. Everybody's contributing. Everybody is a citizen. They pay taxes. They, they contribute to their communities. I want us to move beyond a place where we find it acceptable that we know that a political party will literally punish a community for how they voted. It's yeah. not okay. It's not so okay. I've been saying this a lot in this election campaign. I've been saying to the other leaders, you know, publicly, obviously, and I'll say it to them in the debates, Articulate your vision. What does it look like in 10 years, in 20 years? That's what I want to hear. And, and, and I'm trying my very best to be clear, have the clarity, to articulate a vision of a province that really is centered on health and well-being. And that says, here we are together on this, this planet hurtling through space. <laughs> um, and, and how do we look at how we are as people of British Columbia, and what we can contribute, what we can, what we can do for each other, for our communities, mm -hmm. and what should be our, our basic expectations of good governance, so that we all have these just these foundational conditions where we can all thrive. All our kids go to schools that are healthy, not with asbestos peeling off the walls, not with mold, not in old lead portables. In the pipes. Yeah. No, no lead in the pipes, please. <laughs> All of us can expect to have access to health care that is both preventative, recognizing that health care is, is, is city planning, being able to walk, being able to spend time in green spaces, being able to connect in markets with our neighbors, being able to know that we have small businesses, medium-sized businesses operating with, with people who live in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. These are, those are health initiatives. The, that public health lens which we've so diminished over the, the last many decades, needs to come back up to the forefront. And we need to constantly be asking ourselves, how do we become that thriving, healthy place that we have 
everything we need to become. And yet we accept these decisions from political parties that are not about the health and well-being of the people, but that are about their own parties mm -hmm. and their own fortunes. And, and that's what I'm really putting on the table in this election campaign. And I'm saying to British Columbians, you have an alternative to that. There's, there's a new way of thinking about governance, of doing politics, that, that brings us to the place that we need to be given all the crises. We need to be operating the way we did with COVID. We need to look at, at housing and homelessness, at the opioid crisis, at climate action, environmental action, uh, and, and the affordability cost of living crisis in the same way that we approach COVID, as in all the parties put all the best ideas on the table and we move forward as quickly as we can based on evidence, based on re research and outcomes, and we say these things are beyond politicization. They're beyond politics and partisanship. We owe this to the per people that we serve. So we are... 12 days away, no, 18, 18, 18. 18 days away. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Both with your overall uh, objective of attaining as many seats as possible, but particularly in your riding of Couch and Valley. Hopefully people in Couch and Valley are listening to this. I think you've got a real leader here on your hands. So make sure you go out and vote for Sonia. And, um, and I appreciate coming on. And hopefully you will get reelected. And I'd love to have you back here some point, maybe next year. Uh, once uh, the dust is settled after this election and see how things look and we can talk again but and be, in between now and then best of luck Sonia Sonia first to know thank you BC thank Green you. Party candidate for Couch and Valley and leader of the BC Green Party thanks Andrew